Welcome to another edition of Conversations with Clint. We have just completed our third week of budget hearings and look forward to having a great conversation today about our takeaways from this. Now we had some technical difficulties with the beginning of our video, so if you're watching this, uh, it might go blank for just a few minutes, but uh, it will correct itself. It's very difficult at times when you also hear the secretaries sometimes often say, they're not aware of something that has been proposed by the governor. It almost seems as if, how could that possibly be? Yeah. That we would not have that connection that if you were not in government, but you were in private business, you would never have that disconnect. So it surprises me very often that that, that seems to be the vibe that right. happens or the responses that we get. But again, there's a lot of responsibilities on both sides, so you have to be uh, understanding of pieces of that as well. But uh, if you look at the education system, especially, you know, we look at our higher education system, I think for me, I asked several questions on sustainability and economics and having that more broken out by each university and, and how we are not hurting one university against another and how we expect to really build these universities to give our kids the best education. And uh, there's some numbers there that are concerning. So, uh, and I'm not gonna take all the time because I got the first question. That's I right. could go on and on, but that's just a quick first comment from me. Yeah, I, I was able to ask some questions on the school safety grants. Um, I know that's something we all um, saw those pushed out uh, into our districts this week. And uh, it was interesting to see the governor actually propose to cut that significantly. But there was, there was a request for $116 million worth of uh, competitive grants this year. And, and the, the proposal now is to just is to take that down to $15 million, though there's a lot of need out there. Well, that's so, sort of a connection of almost even where the secretary, even though it doesn't go through the Department of Education, how could that secretary really not be aware of that reduction right. that the governor has proposed? Right. That was also, you know, one piece it's of that. education dollars, just, right? Goes to schools, right. yeah. And it's part of that environment so much that, that what you're talking about is really one of the concerns. And, and it's a big deal. And this, this, this is one of the grant processes that I really like because the school districts design what they want to do. It's not us telling them what to do. They design the safety uh, mechanisms that need to be put in place to make sure that these kids can, can have a safe place to, to go. Um, so that was to see that cut was was kind of astonishing in in, in his proposal and you, you you step back and you think is this really a, pro a a proposal that he wants or does he want us to add that back in they have a, a supplemental which is basically they overspent what the budget was that we enacted last year that the governor signed by uh, over 400 million dollars so they're asking for for nearly a half a billion dollars in a supplemental appropriation to pay for last year's spending they're asking for an increase for next year's spending. And then, oh, by the way, they're also proposing in their budget request to take one, one of the 12 payments for certain for certain programs next year, of 12 monthly payments, and just push it into the following year. And that's to the tune of about $300 million. So that's $800 million that this budget is essentially out of balance just in human services. And then we heard that uh, from, from the finance director at human services that, well, we haven't done our mid-year update yet. And when we do our mid-year update, we're gonna get some shocking numbers about where we're going to actually see the overruns end up. And so what, what we're hearing is in one department alone, this administration is a billion dollars, potentially a billion dollars or more, out of balance. And, and where is the management that's going to bring us there? Where is the, the leadership that's, that, that, that is going to provide us with the projections that we need to actually budget based on good numbers because that's that's what our job is as a legislature is to take the programs that are there the data that's available to us and then enact a budget on behalf of the taxpayers and we're not getting that information for the administration and that's my takeaway is that is we need better management in order to have those numbers so that we can do the job that we've been elected to do and that was one thing that that we noticed was in, in that hearing alone that the comment was made that the demographics are changing well, we've been studying demographics forever. I mean, we, we have people that do that, that, that track trends and we look at you know where we're gonna be five years out, 10 years out, and, and we talk about it in every other hearing that we've had, but then the, the budget that was proposed did not have any adjustments made, yet they're sitting there telling us that 
there's changes that are going to have to become, but you didn't reflect that in your budget. It's amazing to me. Right, and, and just to clarify that, I mean, just to how amazing that is. So, so we enacted a budget last year that the, that the General Assembly passed that the governor signed. He's then come back to, to us while, while we're still in the middle of that budget year and said that wasn't enough and we need more. That's the supplemental request. That's the overspend. But then you look simultaneous to that, they're actually submitting us an estimate for what next year is going to look like. And they're estimating in, in some of these same things they're asking for supplementals on, they're estimating no growth. So what, what that means is they're not giving us the real numbers because they're giving us, um, a, unfortunately, a, a budget that, that doesn't reflect reality so that it has the illusion of looking balanced. So then when it comes out of balance, they're gonna to try to blame the General Assembly, or when, it, when the numbers come out that are, that are actually reflecting reality, they're gonna say, well, the General Assembly added that, when in reality, what the administration did was they failed to give us an accurate, realistic proposal. Right. Jesse, what was your takeaway, or do you wanna to add to this well, conversation? Well, yeah, I, I, think, I think the other thing that we need to note is, yes, the we heard today that a lot of the overspending or the supplemental spending, as Matt pointed out, was in, in terms of entitlements that we have to pay. But I think it's, it's very important to note that there's a lot of discretionary spending that goes on. I mean, there's a, the, the executive branch has a great deal of autonomy when it comes to moving funds around uh, within, within all departments. Not one time have we heard, well, because we saw we were overspending in one of our mandated areas, we then took steps to rectify that by pulling from areas that were not mandated. We have not yet heard anyone say that, and I think it's a very fair question um, to continue to ask the administration, look, why in our own household budgets, in any budget we look at, if we find that the bills that we have to pay are going up more than we thought, then some of the things that we just want, uh, but we don't need to have, also then have to reflect that change. And that's something that we haven't seen from this administration, and that's something that's been very disappointing disappointing to me. You brought up the demographics. That's what, that's what eventually, um, it's already starting to catch up to our higher education. Every one of the chancellor, uh, the college presidents, the, the university presidents, the state relays, they all said the same thing. Less and less college age students are in Pennsylvania, and yet the amount of faculty that we have at all of these universities is the same. The costs are going up, enrollment is going down, and a lot of that is demographic. We are becoming an older state, more retirees, our cost of human services are going up. At some point, we have to make policy changes to reflect those demographics. We can't just keep talking about them, we actually have to address it. And once again, we weren't hearing too many plans from the administration. We, on the other hand, have been talking about how to address that in terms of reforming our PASHI system with the system redesign that several of us are working on with the chancellor. So, you know, I've heard a lot about changing demographics. I hope these same people are willing to get behind the reforms that are necessary to meet those challenges. Yeah, and one of the things that, that we passed last year was that anytime there is a supplemental or an overspend, we got kind of hit on that today. Dearson, we use the word overspend, but overspend, um, that was, uh, that was a, an act that we did last year that gave a specific guidelines that you had to give us, give, us, give the, um, the General Assembly a written reason as to why. Seth, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so it was actually Rosemary's bill. We go Rosemary. Yep, yeah. it was uh, part of the uh, budget reform package that uh, was introduced last session. Um, reintroduced this session, passed to the Senate. Rosemary's, I believe, was the only bill in that package to actually get signed into law as part of the administrative code, which is a, a budget vehicle um, that required the administration to twice a year update the General Assembly on any kind of supplementals. And, and officially, the, the supplemental is overspending. It's, right. it's more it's than it, it's more money than what was appropriated um, through the through the budget. Uh, the supplemental is just a mechanism to pay for it. Um, it's called a supplemental budget, an additional budget to pay for it. Uh, they were always done in the spring, actually. There was actually a second budget that was usually passed. We haven't done it because we haven't had the money. Um, and from what we're seeing is, um, you know, the administration failed to, to live up to that commitment of that legislation and actually provide the specific details of why um, the overspending was occurring within those lines. 
questions. And that's shown because the questions that we've been asking, as you mentioned, have not really been answered uh, with great detail. I know that's frustrating so, uh, to a great degree that, that you're just not getting the answers of why, where that money went. And it, it, it's, it's interesting too, because they have the answers. Um, you know, we had just had Department of Revenue back in today. Um, we so submitted 20 some questions. 20 it? some questions. Uh, Chairman Saylor sent them a letter on February 24th. They responded February 28th with detailed, detailed answers, specific answers, uh, even to some questions we didn't even, Chairman Saylor didn't even have in his letter. They responded with follow ups to other questions. Um, four days, and if, if you're familiar with how the bureaucracy sends letters out, there's multiple touches of individuals that has to go through, attorneys, sign-offs, et cetera. Um, and they did that within four days. So they had the answers, they had all the information, they got it together and sent it back. So they deliberately didn't answer questions uh, at these hearings, which is very frustrating because a lot of them are very simple questions. I'll bring it back to your questions on simple general governmental operation, how they pay their employees, how they pay the fringe benefits, et cetera. That is a very simple budget question that I'm trying to think if anybody actually answered. No. Do we, and, do we... and to hit that point home, remember that questions are prepared by the committee and by the staff and are submitted before these budget hearings are even scheduled. Mm -hmm. And so the administration knows coming into these hearings what sort of questions are, are going to be covered. And every once in a while there will be a question that might be, hey, you know what, that's fair game that, that that was not necessarily something to be anticipated, we'll get that back to you. But but the questions that we're talking about, they had weeks to answer before our first hearing. They did not answer them. And then uh, upon us and upon Chairman Saylor saying, I'm gonna call you back in, all of a sudden, we've got a detailed 27 page answer in four days. So so that tells me that uh, unfortunately, there's some leverage that is required that the, that, that the General Assembly has to execute over the administration just to get the information that the people of Pennsylvania are entitled to. It's not us, it's not that, that, that you make a great point, Matt. It's not that we're asking just because, you know, for our own, our own benefit. I mean, of course, we're the ones putting the budget together, but, but we're having to respond to 65,000 around that number constituents, each one of us, who ask, you know, where are my tax dollars going? And, hey, I heard this, and I, and, and, and I heard this was built, and th these salaries are this, and we're responsible to them who elect us, who send us here as their voice, to get straight answers and to get good answers. And that's why sometimes I know these hearings you know, might come across as contentious, but at the end of the day, it's our responsibility to get answers for them just as much as it is to get answers for us. Uh, no, it's frustrating. I mean, we have constituents that want to see additional dollars in certain line items. If we have agencies spending, have increases of six to seven percent every year just on their employees, that's above revenue growth of about four percent. Right. So they're already above our ability to pay for it just to make up their, their employee their compliments. So where does the additional dollars for education, for higher ed, for you name it, come from um, with, within within the finite resources we have in, in taxpayer dollars? And that's our job as representatives, right? We, we ran on uh, the fact that we would represent our districts well, we would listen, and we would bring those thoughts and concerns to the table whenever we have the opportunity to talk about them. So that's our job, and that's and you're right, it may look contentious, and sometimes it, 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 it is a little bit, but we're trying to bring that level of accountability. So Rosemary, what's your final takeaway um, from the budget process as a whole? I mean, we've, we've, we've done the, the hearing part, now we go. What's something that you're gonna take and bring to the appropriations table when we actually sit down and draft the budget? Well, I think you. We've, we've seen the amount of spending that is being requested. We've seen the amount of money that we approved through the budget when we voted on it last year. So we make that commitment to our people when we vote for that budget. These are the dollars that we have voted for, have committed for you as taxpayers. So obviously taking the, the difference between both is very important and as uh, Representative Grove said, allocating them to certain sections. The one piece that I always think of, whether it's with any department or agency and in your job is the people and people watching today have to remember, we don't just have money. 
right. we get our money from the people. And so even if we get federal dollars, that's still your money. Mm -hmm. And 40%, I think, especially with the Department of Human Services, 40% of our budget, right? A little bit over 40% is, is, is Department of Human Services. So the one piece that I think I always want people to know is you want to help people. You want to help people move forward. You want to offer appropriate services, services that are return on investment. And I like to get rid of that mentality that it's not that you, you want to help people, it's not that you don't, but you have to make sure that it's, it's providing optimal services and it's giving the taxpayer a tremendous return on investment. And if we want more money, the way we get it is we come back to the people. Right. And I know in the area that I represent, there's really not a lot of wiggle room there that people want to do more money. So we have to work with what we have. And it's difficult when you have these agencies coming in and throwing in the supplementals and sort of possibly, possibly playing a game that not giving us correct information so that we can appropriately allocate all the funds. So I think that's where my mindset is going, that are we especially looking at all of that versus the list of supplementals that we have and getting into some more details as to how that's being spent um, and those specific programs that they're very difficult to know every piece of them that we need to. Right. Matt, how about you, same question. What are you, what are you gonna be bringing to the table uh, when we actually sit down to draft this budget. That's our job. We, we have a proposal that we, we've gone through. Now we're going to draft the budget. What's, what, are you, what are you bringing to the table? So what, what I'm bringing to the table is how do we step back and look at the big picture of these are the dollars that are available that the, that the taxpayers of Pennsylvania have entrusted us with. What are the services that they demand that they expect? What are those services that they demand and expect that were zeroed out of the governor's budget that we have to add back? And then how do we have to do how, how do we how do we have to account for the fact that the governor delivered us something that was two billion dollars larger than last year doesn't provide for the services that the people of Pennsylvania have come to expect and how do we adjust that so there's going to be some tough choices and there's going to have to be some reductions in what the governor has proposed and one thing that um, I had to learn very on very very early on in my, my legislative um, uh, time in this capital was that you cannot look at an increase proposed to decrease the increase by a certain amount and call that a cut. But that's that's exactly what the advocates will try to do. You know, the governor will propose an increase of $100 million. And you say, well, maybe that increase should only be $50 million. And all of a sudden, you got people running around saying, you proposed to cut us by half. So that's the... That's the tricky math that we'll hear around this place. But the fact of the matter is, is that we are entrusted with a solemn, sacred responsibility to manage money on behalf of the taxpayers in a way that delivers results. And it's got to come back to accountability and results. And where we're seeing gaps in the management on behalf of the administration is where we have to exert our legislative oversight and insist on measurable data that shows that the dollars are being spent in a way that it, 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 it shows the return on investment for the taxpayer. And that's the direction where we've got to push with this budget over the next few months. Jesse, how about you? Uh, well, we're not going to increase spending without, without also having reforms. And there are many pieces of legislation that are out there in regards to education, charter reform, a higher education reform, our PASHI system, our, our teacher evaluation reform. There's a lot of things that we can do. I know there's uh, reforms and regulatory reform bills that are out there in terms of our oil and gas industry. And, and I mean, there's so many things that we can do to make our government more efficient. And until we do some of those things, until we enact some of those reforms, I think it is disingenuous to think that we're going to go back to the taxpayers that Rosemary's talking about and say, we need more of your money. One of the things that we've seen throughout every um, budget hearing that we've had is that we continue to be one of the most over-regulated states in the union. And until that, until we become a, a better state for our economy and for business, our demographics are going to continue to go in the wrong direction, and we're going to continue to be short-falling with money. We need businesses here. We need regulation reduced. So it's not just about how much we want to spend. It's about how much business are we willing to bring in by having real reform in our government. And I'm going to be looking to, uh, to those bills as well as we talk about how much we're going to appropriate. 
Uh, I'm with Jesse. Policy drives budgets. Budget is a policy document how we spend our money. Uh, every line item in there is tied back to some policy, statute, regulation, something. If we don't change that, we will end up at the same result every single year. Um, I preach it every year. I think I go on my rant about Medicaid and, and DHS budgets every single year. Uh, these entitlement programs, if you don't change the underlying programs, if you don't change the policies driving it, we will continue to see cost increases above the ability of taxpayers to pay for it. Um, it's just a reality. So if we don't dig in and change those policies and vote on stuff that makes sense, improves individuals' lives. A great example is Senate Bill 432, which we passed this year, Governor Wolf signed into law. Uh, simply allowed managed care organizations uh, to access the uh, drug database to provide help and assistance to those who have may have a drug addiction, but it also provided uh, a $20 million savings within our Medicaid capitation line item. A simple change to benefit Pennsylvanians that also benefit taxpayers. Those are the smart solutions we all have bills for that if we don't move, put on the governor's desk, or at least get over the Senate so they're active for negotiation, um, we will not, never, ever get this budget under control. We'll be back in the same situation we are in uh, this time next year. And that's a great point. We have a lot of great policies out there mm -hmm. that, that will help in the process. And um, I'm, I'm specifically going to be looking for waste, fraud, and abuse. We, mm -hmm. We've talked a lot mm -hmm. about that. Um, that is one way that we can really utilize that and some great policy discussions around that to help balance the budget during the next uh, several months of conversation. So that's where we're at. Um, we, we will we'll take these hearings, we'll pick them apart a little bit more, we'll get together as a committee and um, really sit down and, 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 and figure out what we can do and with the resources that we have. And um, we'll, it's, a, it's quite a process, isn't it, Jesse? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a long process. And that's why by the end of it, we're all getting a little uh, a little tired, a little cranky. Uh, although after our last conversation, since we talked about ice cream so much, I ended up going out and getting some ice cream at Dairy Queen, so I feel a little better. You're still smiling. Uh, yeah. I'm still smiling. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're still in smiling. good shape. Rosemary, you missed last time. We all talked about our favorite ice cream at the end. So do you want to throw in your favorite, uh, uh, favorite flavor? Favorite. Yeah, favorite. Favorite. Yeah. Yeah. My favorite. <laughs> Seems to, it was consensus, except Seth's well, kids, one of right? Seth's kids is allergic to oh, that's peanuts, right. peanuts yeah. and he, right. so we had a whole, whole sad story there. Oh. So, okay. yeah, <laughs> yeah. So thinking about, uh, we talked about vehicles, we talked about ice cream at the end of our podcast. Anybody have anything that, that like, we, we, we were accused of doing the kabuki dance uh, today, <laughs> and, uh, which was kind of funny. So my one of my thoughts was, like me personally, like I, I'm not. I don't dance. Like period. I find that exceptionally hard to believe. Come on. No, I guess like I, like I have no rhythm. Like my idea is like, of like my musical talent is pressing play on the CD player. Like I can do that. Like I can set this stuff up, but. So well, and, and from my perspective, it, it's, it's really just safety considerations. The, these arms end up hurting somebody somewhere, and somebody gets hurt. So I just. For the safety of everyone around, I, I kind of tend them out. Yeah. Yeah. Rosemary, how about you? I, you know, like if you go to a wedding, to dance, like right? If you, if you go to Don't a wedding, they say that you're supposed to dance. Like, yeah, I love to dance, dance every day. So if you go to a wedding, are you <laughs> one of the ones out there? I actually do dance. I have no doubt. Okay. I do <laughs> dance. So, I'm not saying I'm a good dancer, but I do dance. I do think the most epic dancing we've seen has been the fiscal dancing on behalf of the cabinet secretary. Oh, oh well done. Nice. Pull it back, 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 back in. Pull it back in. Sorry, we're, we're supposed to be done with work now. We're supposed to be talking fun stuff. So I'm sorry. I'll step back. No. That's good. Well, thank you guys for joining us and um, look forward to talking maybe again when we start to hash out some of the budget. Do you have interested in coming back? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for tuning in and we look forward to continuing to serve you and represent you down here in Harrisburg. And if there's anything that we can do, any state related issue for any of us, um, we would love to help you out. Stop by our office, give us a call, and uh, we are here to serve you. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>